Breakfast on the beach. Well, we continue our post-resurrection stories today. I remind you that Jesus has met with the woman. He's met Simon Peter randomly. We don't know what that, that uh, brief encounter, what it looked like. The scripture just refers to it in a single verse. He's met with the two people on the road to Emmaus, and we had a look at that story. He's met twice with his, with his disciples after his resurrection. We had a look at those stories. Uh, first time probably on Resurrection Sunday, the next time eight days later, on the next first day of the week. Um, and now he meets with seven of the 11 remaining disciples. We don't know when it took place. It could have been any time after that second meeting and the 40-day period that he met with people from time to time before he ascended. So let's go to that passage in John chapter 21 and we read the scripture together. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee uh, in Galilee. Uh, and then it says it happened this way. So it starts by saying afterwards Jesus appeared again to his disciples. It's kind of introducing the story, and now it tells the story. It happened in this way, verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Didymus meaning the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. So there's seven of them all together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize or realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, lads, fellows, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, and we take that to be John, the author of this gospel, said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards, ninety odd meters. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there, with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to, him, to them, did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Let us commit this word to the Lord. Father, we thank you that we've had an opportunity to hear your word being read to us this morning. We thank you for the life-giving nature of your word. Thank you that it never returns empty. You will accomplish what you've set out for this word to accomplish. And I pray that you would find willing and receptive hearts as we talk about your word this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we go through verse by verse this morning, I want to share with you uh, four life lessons, if you like, for us as believers. Four life lessons for us as believers. And the first one is quite simply that human ability is so limited. Our own efforts are so pathetic when we look at at the broader picture of things. Verse 1 again, after Jesus appeared again, and that word appeared means he was made manifest. He supernaturally appeared, a sudden appearance. And he would have appeared in that body that he had received or that he had raised from the dead with, that body that still had the nail holes in his 
in his hands and his feet and the hole in his side. That body that supernaturally appeared through walls, etc., etc. So there he was standing suddenly on the beachfront uh, by the Sea of Galilee. We need to note at this stage that seven of his disciples were disobedient. Those seven who were there, who were out fishing on the shore, on the sea that night, were not living according to what he had called them to do. We, we don't know where the others were, but we can only presume that they were where Jesus told them to be. And this is where he told them to be. Matthew 28, 16. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to what? To the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. We don't know what mountain it is, scripture doesn't tell us, but Jesus had specifically directed all 11 to go to Galilee and to wait for him on this specific mountain. That's probably the same mountain when they were all together again when he gave them the great commission later in Matthew 28 when he says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So they eventually got there, obviously. But at this stage, we find Peter, we find Thomas, we find Nathaniel, we find James, John, and two others disobediently fishing. I suspect they got tired of waiting on the mountain. And they snuck off to do what they had been doing previously before Jesus had called them. See, at some stage, right in the beginning of the Gospels, Jesus, when he was calling them, had said, Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Leave this fishing. Leave the boats. Leave the net. Leave this means of whatever you're doing. Come and follow me. And I'm going to teach you how to catch men. So these seven disciples were, strictly speaking, not doing what God had called them to do. At this stage, they should still be waiting for him on the mountain. Verse 2 says, it happened in this way. These Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan, Galilee, sons of Zebedee, two other disciples were together. Here's impetuous Peter. Off in the wrong direction. I'm going to fish, Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. The application, I think, is clear. In our own strength, we will always catch as much as they did. Absolutely nothing. When we up and off on our own mission, there's simply nothing in the net. You see, human ability is just so limited. And even when we use the measure that the world uses sometimes, oh, that church, there are tens of thousands of people who attend that church, or that church is always full to the brim, or that church is doing that church, and we use all of these other worldly methods, it all counts for absolutely nothing. They knew where to fish. They knew how to fish. They knew what to fish with. They had grown up and lived here. They knew they all, all there was to know about fishing. And you know what they caught? Absolutely nothing. The Lord had not told them to go back to their previous life. They were being disobedient. He had told them to go to a certain mountain in Galilee and to wait for them. I suspect they were tired of waiting. I suspect nothing was happening and I think that happens with us too sometimes. We get tired of waiting. We get tired of not seeing the Lord answering our prayers. We get tired of, of just sitting back and, and not doing anything. So we go out and we furiously try to do stuff. That's not what God wants us to be doing. If there's nothing happening, don't try and make it happen. When he says wait, we wait. When he says go, we go. So it's early in the morning and Jesus is standing on the shore. The disciples don't recognize him. And he calls out to them, friends, lads, hey guys, you got any fish? 
No, they answered. <sighs> Simon Peter led them down this path, you see. I'm going fishing. Let's go. Who's coming with me? Ever been in that sort of situation where the wrong friends have led you down the wrong path? <laughs> We're just sitting around not doing anything. Let's go and do something. I think it's a little lesson for us to be careful that we are not part of the influence that, that Simon Peter had on his friends. <clears throat> anyway, let's keep going. I lost my place here. Sorry. They fish all night. There's not even the tiniest fish in the net. They come up short in every, reason, in every way. And the reason they caught nothing is that the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth would not allow them to catch anything. They could have fished there for six weeks and they would not have caught anything. It's the Lord who controls the universe. The Lord who controlled every single fish in the Sea of Galilee. And he was not going to allow a single fish to go into their nets that night in order to teach them a very important lesson. Their disobedience, their self-sufficiency, their trusting in their own ability and their own wisdom took them down. Jesus had to wake them up to this fact. See, he had already taught them, remain in me, in John 14, and I will remain in you, John 15, I beg your pardon. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Wait for me on that mountain in Galilee. They busy fishing. <laughs> and he's teaching them again, remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Friends, this lesson is valid for us today. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Oh yes, you can brush your teeth apart from the Lord and you can get in your car and drive to work and yeah, you might even run a hugely successful business and all sorts of wonderful things. But apart from him, you can do nothing of any spiritual value. Nothing. If you are out fishing when he's told you to be on the mountain, you can do absolutely nothing. And that's the lesson he's teaching his disciples. He uses this physical demonstration by them catching no fish to teach them a truth in the spiritual realm. And it's a lesson we all need to know every moment of every day, abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ, not disconnecting ourselves, going off and doing our own thing. That's why the Bible encourages us to pray continually. Why we need to be consciously aware all the time of our dependence upon the Lord. Spiritual fruit never happens when we try and do it in our own ability. You can't just put your cruise control on and hope that it's all going to happen. It doesn't. We will continue to catch nothing if we are not abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Well, human ability is so limited. It's that simple. The opposite is just as true. Divine ability, of course, is unlimited. Divine ability speaking about his sovereignty, speaking about his omnipotence, his all-powerfulness. Divine ability speaking of who he is as creator and sustainer of his universe. Yeah, we find these guys, they fished all night, and they come back empty-handed. They're tired, probably hungry. Some guy on the beach whom they don't recognize, whom tells them now, uh, throw your nets on the other side, and you will find some. Disciples don't know it was Jesus. Maybe because it was still dark. Maybe because it was misty. Maybe because he hadn't allowed them to see that it was him yet, as he did in previous post-resurrection appearances to other people. The text doesn't tell us why they didn't recognize him. But I, I don't know about you. My reaction would have been, who's he? 
I mean, I've been fishing all my life. I've been doing this all my life. And some guy on the beach says, throw your net on the other side and you'll catch something. <sighs> I'm tired. I'm hungry. I don't need this kind of in interfere. Anybody else like that? It's just proud me. You know, just bug off and leave me alone. You know, just go and find something else to do. <laughs> throw your net on the other side. We don't understand why they listened to him. The Bible doesn't tell us. To me, it makes no sense outside of the fact that God's hand sovereignly moved upon them to listen to this guy on the beach, and they did what they were told to do. There's no ways on this planet I would have listened to those guys. I would have started my motor and gone off in the other direction. Really. I believe, again the text doesn't tell us, but the fact that they just listened to this guy without recognizing Jesus speaks of unlimited divine ability to move upon the hearts of men to do what seems to be the impossible or the stupid at that moment in time. They take his advice and something amazing happens. See, there is nothing impossible for God. The disciples knew that. They didn't know he was God on the beach. But they were starting to understand now. Jesus is teaching them a very important lesson. Probably a lesson he had taught them over and over again that they'd experienced over and over again. Now, it doesn't matter that there might have been people who were catching on the left-hand side or over here or over there. He said the right-hand side. And when he said the right-hand side, absolutely nothing limited that at all. Some of you work with people and you think they'll never get this gospel. How is somebody ever going to understand? Listen, if those seasoned fishermen could listen to some stranger on the beach and do what they were told. You keep praying for your worker, fellow worker. You keep praying for your child. You keep praying for your parent. Because when the time is right, something will happen. The divine ability is unlimited. When they did it, they were unable, the Bible says, to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. It happens immediately. It's no coincidence. There's so many fish in this net that they can't bring it in. The sovereign Lord of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, commands exactly 153 large fish to immediately swim into that net. He's in control. See, you do what I say, and there will be fruit. He's sovereign over the success of their obedient labor. And just as Jesus commanded fish to swim into their nets, he commands lost swim sinners to swim into the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, it's our job to cast the nets as he instructs, and he will ensure the fish come in. The story here is a reenactment of a miracle Jesus has already performed, by the way, in Luke chapter 5. It's almost as if Jesus is reminding them again, are you paying attention? I have unlimited divine power. I am the sovereign Lord. Wake up, you know. You will catch men just as you've catched these feet. There's Caught these feet, catch these easier, just as you've catched these fish. <laughs> it's easier to say at any rate. You will catch men if you just keep casting where the Father tells you to cast. Verse 7 The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, 
John says to Peter, it's the Lord. And it dawns on John that this is the Lord who's standing there on the shoreline because he's the only one who can do this. It is the Lord. It is the sovereign one, the ruler, the master, the controller of the universe whose divine ability is unlimited. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say it's the Lord, he puts on his clothes because he obviously would have stripped basically with his jocks on or near naked to do the fishing thing. He covers himself out and he jumps into the water. He wasn't missing out a moment longer. He just wanted to get to Jesus. He wanted to be where the Lord is. See, Peter was quick to fall into sin and he's quick to want to be restored. He needs to get to Jesus. The other disciples followed in the boat, verse 8, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 91 meters. His divine ability, friends, is unlimited. I think this is what the miracle means. In the power of his sovereign grace, he's drawing men to himself, dragging them 90 meters where necessary. My Bible says, all that the Father gives me, Jesus, in John chapter 6 says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. Not a single fish in the net when all night, exactly 153 when they cast exactly where Jesus told them to. Not one missing that wasn't supposed to be 154 fish. Well, it wasn't 152 and one sneaked in the back door. It was 153 fish. It's specific. I think that this miracle is a picture, in fact, of Pentecost onwards. And indeed, the, the rest of the book of Acts and all the New Testament teaches us. It teaches us of his unlimited divine ability. He who will command the souls of men that are perishing. He who overcomes their resistance, breaks them down by his grace and giving to them repentance and faith. In Acts chapter 2, we see 3,000 after Peter preaches. But later we read the Lord was adding to their number daily those who had been saved. Acts chapter 4, we read about 5,000 of them, just men, not talking about the women and the children. And so the number increases. The sign miracle that Jesus is performing in his unlimited divine power so that there's so many fish they're battling to drag it to shore is a forward view of what's right around the corner for these men whom, whom he has called to catch men, not fish any longer. Friends, divine ability and sovereignty is unlimited. There is nothing impossible for God. Can I get an amen? amen? The third little life lesson is that godly results are lasting results. And my son and I have these debates quite often. It's one thing to catch fish. Catch fish. It's another thing to keep them. Now I say that thing about my son and I because he's probably more right than I was. But we'll leave that to, I don't want to confess anything in front of him today. <laughs> the simple truth is not one got away. Not one fish got away. The miracle, however, hasn't ended yet. Verse 9, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coal, coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard, dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. The net was not torn. The net did not break. The fact that the gospel writer includes this detail says in every aspect that net should have been shredded. The net should have been broken. It's not possible to hold 153 mega is the Greek word. Mega fish. And he specifies the net was not torn. 
He would not allow one to get away. Friends, that's just like it with people. I think that's the demonstration. Whom he calls and saves, he keeps. God's results are lasting results. Jesus is teaching them that once a fish is truly caught, it'll stay caught. Can I put it another way? Once saved. If you properly saved, you will always be saved. Every true believer in Christ Jesus will continue to follow the Lord no matter what. The Bible says no one who is born of God will continue to sin. Doesn't mean you, you stop sinning. Doesn't mean that you get to a stage of, of you know, perfection and you never sin. It means that you will not continue. If you're a gossip, you will stop gossiping. That's what it means. You cannot call yourself a believer and you keep gossiping. You'll repent and you gossip and you repent and you gossip and you repent and you gossip. I don't care if you're an elder in the church or you're the pastor or you've been in church for a 50, 100 years. If you continue to gossip, you're not born of God. It's that simple. That's what it means. Because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. 1 John 2 verse 19, they went out from us, and we all know people who went out from us. They went out from us. Why did that person turn their back on the Lord? That person was in church their whole life. Why did they turn away from the Lord? That person was a pastor. Look what they did. And now they're just living far from the Lord. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. They were in the net, but that net had holes in. <laughs> they weren't in the proper net. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. So they were never really in the net. Godly results are lasting results. The point here for me of the net not being torn was to give an object lesson to these disciples that those whom the Lord will draw and bring into the kingdom, the ones who truly are in the kingdom, will never leave the kingdom. My sheep, Jesus said in John 10, listen or hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. And here's the clincher. Excuse the pun. No one can snatch them out of my hand. They will always and forever be in the grip of the Lord. Forever. Now, if that doesn't put your soul at ease, if you don't feel like just <sighs> resting in Jesus right now, I want to call you to salvation. I mean that with all my heart. There's nothing that settles my spirit more than knowing I will always be in that, that grip of the Lord, that nothing and no one can snatch me out of, my, out of his hand. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion till the day of Christ Jesus. You might be sitting here this morning thinking, well, the way I behaved this week, I can't even call myself a believer. Me too. <laughs> Do you know what? I just read his word again, and it settles my spirit. I know I'm in the net. Jesus, in John 6.35, declared, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus is telling his disciples, go preach the gospel, and I will bring people into the net that will never break. 
Are you worried about sharing the gospel with someone? Are you worried about telling somebody about the Lord? Are you worried about whether you should or whether you shouldn't? Jesus is simply saying, you just go and cast the net. You go and do the work of casting the net. And I'm going to work with you on this one. This is the confidence that we should have in the sovereign operation of God in the hearts of those whom he draws into the net of the gospel. It will never break. The net of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. If somebody truly commits their life to Christ, that net will never break. Some of you might have heard of Charles Spurgeon. He's known as the Prince of Preachers. <laughs> he once said, Noah fell down many times in the ark, but he never once fell out of the ark. <laughs> and I'm just so like that. How many times I fall down daily in the ark, but I know I'll never fall out of the ark, ever, because he's got me in the palm of his hands. Now, <laughs> I know there are lots of, if you continue, scriptures that can confuse you in the Bible. But those, if you continue, scriptures doesn't mean you lose what you have. It means you lose what you never had in the first place. So when you, co when you come across, across those scriptures that says, you know, you must do this, you will inherit eternal life if you continue or whatever, it, it really means... If you continue, it means you were there in the first place. If you don't continue, you were never there in the beginning. Amen? Amen. And the last little thought this morning, intimate fellowship is our benefits, our reward, our inheritance. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And then Jesus does what he had done with them so many times before took bread, gave it to them, did the same with the fish. This was now the third time he had appeared after he was raised from the dead. Jesus invites his disciples to sit down, to have fellowship with him. It's interesting to me in this case, the Lord does not scold them. He doesn't criticize them. He doesn't ask them what they'd been thinking. What are you doing? You're supposed to be on the mountain. I didn't tell you to go back fishing, go back to your old way of life. I told you to meet me on the mountain. Instead, here we find Jesus. He started the bri. I mean, what a better place for fellowship uh, than around a fire. They've been fishing all night. They're probably tired and hungry. And he attends to their physical needs. He serves them. They probably would have remembered the time he took off his clothes and wrapped a towel around his waist and went and washed their feet and dried them with that towel. They must have remembered that, that lesson of servanthood. He teaches them, though, another lesson here. You need to stay connected and in fellowship with me. He allows them to see it's actually him who makes ministry happen and effective. They caught nothing without him. They didn't catch a single man. They were back to their old job. They were hiding in that room beforehand. It's all about him. He caused the fish to swim into the net. He prevented the net from breaking. The lesson is clear. God provides. And you have intimate fellowship with him. What a win-win situation. To have intimate fellowship with the Lord of the universe. What would we do without this fellowship? Do you have fellowship with him? Do you take time to have breakfast with Jesus? Notice Jesus didn't come to them just before they were falling asleep. And you say your prayers quickly. You know, how many of you fall asleep while you're still praying at night? First time you've spoken to God all day and you fall asleep while you're busy doing it. Jesus does it early in the morning <laughs> when they're still wide awake. 
and he gives them fellowship with his breakfast. Psalm 40 verse 8, I desire to do your will, O my God. Do you desire to do his will? Do you desire to have fellowship with him? Do you desire to eat breakfast with him? To have fellowship, intimate fellowship, knowing that this one who has provided everything, whose power is unlimited, this one who provides everything we could possibly need, he will provide the souls of men. <laughs> if we just cast the net when we're in close contact and fellowship with him. Let me summarize. Human ability is so limited. Give up trying to do things on your own strength. Uh, we, often, we often think that we're just going ahead and doing what he wants us to do and da-da-da-da-da-da. Just, just, just put it aside. We can accomplish no good thing apart from him. On the other hand, his divine ability is totally, completely, and 100% unlimited. When he does something, they always last. Intimate fellowship is our benefit, our reward, our inheritance. It's just our joy. Do you have breakfast with Jesus? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word this morning that we've been able to read and try to understand. Lord, remind us, I pray, that you have, as your disciples, have called us all to be fishers of men. And thank you that we don't have to stress and struggle and sweat over the hows and the wheres and the whys and whether we like fishing or not because it's all your power it's all you, you're doing you just call us to cooperate with you to do what you call us to do thank you for those who perhaps have more visible ministries and are out on the mission field and doing stuff we do bless you for their callings and their lives and their commitments. But I thank you, Lord, that for each one of us, each one, you have called us to cast nets as well. Thank you that not one will be lost as we do that. Thank you that you keep us all safe. Thank you that no one can ever snatch us out of your hand. And may we be found faithful in casting nets around us by our example, by our words, by our deeds, by our lives. Lord, for those of us who have forgotten what it's like to have breakfast with you, would you draw us back? Would you draw us to that place of being able to say, I delight to do your will, O oh God. That there would be a commitment in each one of our hearts just to spend time with you, with your word, with your people. Wonderful Jesus. We bless you and thank you in Jesus' name.